my brother had to pay two thousand dollar for my ransom. I got sold to three different men, and that's how I ended up being two thousand dollar. You know, I was a bit more expensive because here's the thing: I've seen where there's a, it's not a black market, but it's just a market, and that they would make um, Africans. You know that they call us donkeys. They always called us donkeys, so they called them donkeys. And, you know, they would make them stand and they are betting money on them. CNN or BBC, they, it, it got released, it got licked. And, you know, it's like uh, you're going to buy, like, a, a chicken or something in a market where you're picking and choosing which one do you want to have. Like, that's how bad it is. And for girls, uh, ouch, something in my eye. And for the girls, you know, you're just a sex slave. Um, yeah. I've seen a lot of people saying, like, um, for me to explain. So what I can say is so many other Eritreans that I met there, when they asked them, they all say it's the problem in Eritrea. I'm not going to lie. I went to Eritrea in 2014. There is no water, okay? The water goes off. There is no electric city. The electric goes out. So it's a full blackout, okay? You can't get a normal job. There, There isn't a job. You get it. And... A lot of the families that are in Eritrea now, the way they are surviving is because we Eritreans that are like, like for example, let's say my mom is in Eritrea, I send her money. That's how she will be able to leave. You get it. So even the immigrants that are in Europe or in America, they're sending money back home to their family. Uh, and there's no like universities and stuff. There's few colleges, but the government decides for you which which line you're going to be working in because I have a cousin that studied to be a doctor and now she's a fucking nurse, okay? She never wanted to be one, but she is. So there's so much things that's happening in Eritrea. I can't speak for Ethiopia because I'm not from there. I haven't been from there. Uh, I haven't been there. I can't speak for Somali people because I'm not from there and I haven't been in Somali, so I can't speak for their issues to why they're going that path. But for me, as Sarun Getacho, when I started that path, I was given a wrong information, like everything is safe, nothing happens. Uh, in the desert, it's just four days. In the water, it's four hours. Like in a week, like everything goes smooth, like nothing will happen. Everything started happening as soon as I left, you get it? And I remember, I remember calling my brother and I was crying. I was crying. I was like, oh my God, they're torturing people. I don't know what to do. People are screaming. Like grown men are screaming for their mom, you know. A lot of people, this word, yimma, got stuck in my head because that's what most people were screaming. Yimma, their mom. And and my brother was like, no, no, Sarah, like focus. Like you need to make sure you get out alive. You're in danger now. And yeah, and I did, you know, I, I I'm out. But I watch how they would put a, a nail on a stick and then they would make them like kneel down and then they would hit them with it on the white uh, part of their f- foot, feet. Yeah, it don't matter. D- d- don't care about my grabbers. <laughs> Whatever it is, this is their leg, the white part, and then they would put a needle on the stick and then hit them with it so that they, they can't reproduce or I don't know why. <laughs> And they would they would even shave off their hair and then put kerosene and then make them kneel on the sun and sometimes even lay, you know. There's so many times where I was sitting and they would shoot all the way here. Thank God I made it out <laughs> without any bullets or anything or it just with my life, you get it. I made it out, but they always shot at me. And there was, there was this woman, I never forget, she was pregnant, five months. They they raped her and tortured her to the point she had a miscarriage. And then they took the baby and they buried him and then they kept on torturing her. I don't know if she's dead, alive, I don't know what happened to her because we got separated because I got sold. I also remember there was a time we tried to run away. You know, I caught the girls. They were going to run at night. And I was like, fuck it. I'm out with you guys. You know, anything can happen. But let it happen because we were tired. And when they had me, they had me for three months and two weeks. So here in Sweden, I live in Sweden. I am diagnosed with Stockholm Syndrome. 
because I really felt like they were like brothers to me, you know, because I was like, oh my God, like they're not doing anything. They're taking care of me. But then when I came here, they explained to me like I fucked up. I brought this to show you guys. This is all I take for me to function as a as a normal person but when i take it all my colleagues friends tell me like a zombie saron but i have no other choice you get it the the memories and the mark and the scar that libya left is not just on me it's so many other habish people they are suffering in silence you know and they don't want to talk about these things because then people are like oh who told you to go there why did you go there like everyone planned for this to happen if you ask me not even in a billion years have i ever thought i would get kidnapped and sold you know and when they had me i remember one time when we got kidnapped it was at night it was late night and they came in and they were saying like miss Hain, you know it's like christians and then i asked the girl that was with me like what are they saying you know she she told me she translated they were like all these Christians, he cut off their head, you know? And then they asked me if I wanted to be a Muslim. I was like, yeah, like, just don't cut off my head, you get it? I'm like, yeah. And, and then they changed my name from Saro to Sabrine. And that's when I got to, it felt like I was invisible and I was just witnessing what was happening to the people. I, I saw when they uh, <laughs> took a gun. And put it to four Somali men. And they shot them dead, you know? I saw the whole blood, everything explode. And they forced us to clean up the aftermath of what they did. And and they brought out the guys, you know? So they can bury the body. They took them with them and they buried the bodies. There were so many other Eritreans also, which they tortured them. To the point they died, and I remember one time, uh, there was a time, you know, uh, when we tried to run away. The Libyans called our smuggler, his name was Abdus Salam, and uh, he's Eritrean. And they they called him and they told him, like, you know, for the girls who tried to escape and we got caught, we were 26. They said, send $26,000, you know. And then he sent a, a, a taxi, you know, to pick us up. And the taxi man, he had nothing to do with it, but they met him up to the point he died. And then they took away the money. And I remember I was brought out, I was being dragged. And I still remember how his body was laid flat. And then they put the blanket and then there was so many flies. And his hair was hanging out. And then I was sitting on like a, it was like a floor, sand thing. And they were like trying to force me and I, and I just froze, you know. That wasn't the first time I saw a body. But that was the first time where I saw someone who had nothing to do with any of this business getting killed. They would also shoot people and throw them into the sea. There is so many Eritreans where they... I don't want to say Eritrean. Let me just say East Africa so everyone can understand. They would gang rape them. They would rape I can't say rape, I think, but I'm just saying it. But assault them, gang, you know? And then they would also use their pistols and their AK-47 to R-word guys and girls. And sometimes they would just shoot you or shoot you in the leg, whatever they feel like. And they would also sell you to others. And at night... They would come to choose girls who they want to rape. I just say that again, but yeah. Who they want to do that. Uh, so they have been watching us during the day. So at night, they would come and take us. I remember there was a time where they picked me. You know, I only used to show my eye and they, they chose me by my eye. Do you know how sick that is? They made us line up and they put flashlight and then they chose me. <laughs> 